Committee on Rules will now come to order. The matter before the committee this, this, this evening <coughs> uh, is H.R. 2264, from the Committee on Budget. Conference report on the Omnibus Budget Reconciliation Act of 1993. We're very honored to have the Chairman of the Budget Committee, the Honorable Martin Sabo. Mr. Sabo. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the, the Rules Committee. It's a pleasure uh, to be in front of you again. Uh, let me just say a few words about the agreement and a couple words about the rule. Is that uh, is okay? Absolutely. You're the okay. chairman. Okay. Well, you're the chairman. So. Well, let's, uh, is this, this is your bill. Okay. Uh, this, agreement <laughs> is, <coughs> this agreement is the first step toward getting our fiscal house in order. Uh, it's a bill that produces real long-term deficit reduction significant spending cuts, restores tax fairness, and makes important investments in people and jobs. Under it, federal spending will be reduced $255 billion and taxes increased by $241 billion. More than 80% of tax increases fall on the most affluent members of society, families making over $200,000 a year. It includes one of the most significant incentive packages ever for small business creation and capital formation. Through tax incentives, credits, and changes in expensing provisions, more than 90% of small businesses throughout America will get incentives to grow, expand, create new jobs. Only the wealthiest 4% of small business owners, those with incomes over $500,000, will see an average over 500,000 will see a tax increase. It also includes important investments in people. The earned income tax credit will encourage work and help low-income working families ri rise above the poverty level. And the increase in food stamp program will re reach millions of hungry children. In the final analysis, no one can challenge the importance of what this package will accomplish or the fairness of how it will be done. When we vote on this bill, I call upon all of my colleagues to join us in voting yes for action, yes for change, yes for the economic package that will restore growth to the American economy. Mr. Chairman, I would uh, request a rule that uh, I think has a couple of basic uh, requirements. Uh, one, uh, waiving all points of order against the conference uh, report and against its uh, consideration. And secondly, uh, uh, I view it's very important, uh, implementing the entitlement uh, review mechanism that was contained in the original bill uh, and uh, providing in the rule for a mechanism uh, in the House uh, through changes in the House rules to implement that provision of the bill, uh, which we could not agree to in conference uh, because it would have required 60 votes in the U.S. Senate. Martin, what did you say the uh, spending cuts amount to in this bill? Uh, 255. 200. I frankly think that understates that I've had trouble all along in how spending cuts are measured. I think it's, they're actually more, but uh, that's what's clean. And the taxes are what? 241. So it's a $496 billion yes. bill. In my judgment, the spending cuts are understated, as I think I've indicated several times, particularly I think uh, defense cuts are understated in terms of how we've been measuring them in comparison to baseline, but that would add 40, 45 billion dollars to, to, uh, to, the, to the spending cuts, but that's not part are of the tax cuts being claimed. Are the tax cuts over, is the tax overstated? No, I don't think so. Yeah, I think that's about right, huh? Okay. Um, I know that you've worked very hard on this thing, and uh, uh, you know we on the Rules Committee have been waiting anxiously to, to handle this. Uh, and uh, I, I know it's a very difficult chore, uh, but I just think that you come out in the proper, uh, the mix that uh, we were trying to get, and I, I just want to congratulate you, Father. I, I thank the chairman, and it's been a unique experience. It involves uh, many of the committees of the House, and I have to say that uh, the various committee chairs and Scores of House members have worked very hard to put this bill together. Uh, I involved the jurisdiction of many of our standing committees, and uh, 
we set the targets and they worked very, very hard to meet those targets and uh, I commend all of them for the great work and effort they put into this effort. Was the, uh, the problem that you had facing you uh, so you couldn't meet the midnight deadline, was that taken care of properly? Yes. Uh, we were sorry we couldn't make it last night by midnight. We were 99.9% .9 there, but... No, we waited for you. Uh, by today, that one-tenth, the one, one-hundredth, the one-percent was worked out. Good. Mr. Derrick. I have no questions uh, other than to say that we thank you for a job well done. Thank you. Mr. Solomon. <coughs> well, first of all, uh, Mr. Chairman uh, Sable, let me uh, commend you for being one of the uh, hardest working members of this, uh, of this Congress. Uh, I don't agree with your, with your product that you have here, uh, but that shouldn't detract. I was uh, hoping you'd change your mind. <laughs> no, we, we caucused today. We, we talked about it. Okay. And uh, we, we, we talked about the, the tax increases. And I think you just said they're $241 billion. And we talked about the spending cuts uh, that are promised and uh, being $255 billion. But what, what are the spending increases in the bill? I mean, you know, there are uh, additional the, programs. The 496 is net. Mm -hmm. um, there are... You don't have to list them. I don't I just have, wondered how much the total... You know, there's a change in the earned income tax credit, which is an offset to taxes. Some, in the way they're counted now, is cut as, counted as reduction is in, in, uh, in taxes. Some are counted as re as outlays. I frankly think they could all be cut as counted as offset to revenues. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a modest increase, about two and a half billion dollars net in food stamps. Uh, there are several provisions in the tax part of it where tax expenditures are made. Uh, for instance, uh, so some of the tax uh, tax credits are made per permanent. Uh, others, I understand the the uh, R&D tax credit is, uh, goes back one year, retroactively extended two years forward. Uh, there's the expensing allowance for a small business. Uh, there is the uh, targeted capital gains tax break for small business. Those are tax expenditures, not direct expenditures. Mm -hmm. uh, there may be some other modest changes. I think it's a billion dollars uh, over five years for the Family Preservation Act. $500 million uh, for an immunization program. And there may be some other small odds and ends, but those would be the bulk of them. A significant number of them are on the tax expenditure side. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> well, let me uh, just say this. Before you say anything, I, again, I, I, I've told you this privately, and let me say uh, to the full committee, I appreciated your cooperation yesterday and having available uh, the option of filing till midnight, which unfortunately we couldn't do, but I appreciated your cooperation. Well, <clears throat> we we wanted to be as helpful as we can, since we can't give any votes. Uh, we, we we certainly don't want to uh, <laughs> don't want to want to want to block your your efforts to put your bill on the floor. Uh, the problem is, you know, when when President Clinton first pr uh, produced his budget, you know, we were talking about um, in excess of 300 billion dollars in new taxes, and the spending cuts in his original budget that he that he presented to us uh, called for. Uh, spending cuts, but most of them taking place uh, in the last three years of this five-year cycle. And uh, as I've been able to look at the product that, that came out of the conferees, and we only received it about an hour ago, there hasn't been a great deal of change to that. And uh, that really, I think, is what, uh, what the American people object to in this product. I know it's difficult for you to, uh, uh, to deal with that, but it, uh, the truth of the matter is that uh, uh, some future Congress is going to have to live up to the rest of our agreement as far as the major part of, this, of the spending cuts are concerned, and yet the taxes uh, are going to take place not only immediately but retroactively. And that's why the calls coming in, I stayed in my office till midnight last night and received about 70-some uh, calls in my office down here. And then uh, all day today, we, we had almost 500 phone calls. And it was running about 10 to 1 against. I understand uh, when I talked to Senator Al D'Amato, 
who represents also New York City, in addition to uh, the rest of the state of New York, that his calls were running uh, at, at about the same rate. And uh, so it was a wide spectrum of people. But uh, uh, those are the things we're concerned about. Let, but let me, uh, just so we can get this rule going and get it out on the floor, what are these uh, waivers uh, of scope that you're asking for? What, what is the difference in, in between, uh, uh, why do you have to ask for a scope waiver? over and above what was in the two bills? Oh, I don't know. that. You know, we just want to make sure that there's not some technical point of order that somebody makes that we haven't thought of. You know, yeah, most of our delay for days and now has been trying to get it and make certain that this bill would meet Senate rules, which uh, right. well, we I can't waive them. Out of the we bird have rule. a problem with the Bird Rule, the right. Budget Act, and uh, we just want to make sure that we don't have a, but there must any be. technical okay. uh, um, uh, amendments. Uh, when, when the bill left the House, uh, was there retroactivity on some of the taxes yes. in the House bill? And on the uh, tax breaks. The, the effective date of the income taxes in the House yeah. bill was January 1st, 1993. So, so you haven't exceeded scope on any no. of the retroactive... And, uh, uh, and uh, the uh, R&D business tax credit was retroactive in the House bill, mm -hmm. uh, continues to be retroactive in here. I, I have to say that I have not found anyone... Uh, complaining about retroactivity when it applies uh, to tax re tax uh, reductions in this bill. And there are several that uh, go back to, to the previous year. I'd be glad to yield my friend. You know, I, I would just say that it's, it's my understanding that we have looked at uh, the scope question for about the last hour since we've had it and mm -hmm. found no, no reason and, and merely put that in there as just, just in case up. something. Mm -hmm. That we have not, we have no reason to believe that it's our scope. Yeah, I concur with that. Uh, we I, just felt the one that I, I'm not sure if it's out of scope. Uh, the uh, change in uh, how we treat Social Security uh, recipients is higher in the conference report than in either the. Well, houses. then that is out of scope. Then I don't know if that's beyond scope. Yeah, if you're doing that, I would think so. Yeah. And, uh, okay, well, that's the things I was looking for because we haven't had a chance to really analyze the, you know, uh, the whole The major bill tax the, provisions and the major provisions of the bill, they're generally within the realm of either with, between the House and the Senate bill. Okay. There may be, and I know better in this business, uh, and having, you know, 13 committees involved to say there's none, but uh, okay. of the big provisions of the bill, I don't think there are any. Well, Mr. Chairman, you see, this is uh, this is one of the problems that we have. Uh, uh, it's my understanding that you might not uh, uh, be allowing us our motion uh, to recommit with instructions, uh, to, uh, and uh, bec because of that, and because of not really knowing if there are other issues, even though I, I realize you don't think there are. Well, uh, we, we would like the opportunity to be able to, uh, at least if we do over the next uh, 12 hours before the bill comes on the floor tomorrow, to be able to uh, at least be able to make some corrections and have a vote on it if there are things that, that aren't obvious to us at this point. And I'm sure they're not, uh, you, you haven't read that bill, uh, you know, uh, verbatim, uh, no. uh, you know, completely through. Is there any reason why the minority cannot have our traditional motion to recommit? I think conference committees, it's normally a motion to recommit no. without instructions. Right. No, it's, yeah. as you well know, timely, uh, you know, the schedule as well as anybody else, and if have a motion or recommit with instructions, uh, we're just not going to make our time schedule, and I just think that... Uh, well, not if, we, not if we want to go home Friday night, but uh, uh, we, we could stay Saturday and uh, didn't deal with it if we had to, if there were... But there, there aren't that many changes, though, between the House and Senate positions. No. Not on major provisions of the bill. The, th well, the threshold of Social Security is the one that uh, is yeah. higher. Uh, the uh, income tax ones... Uh, Corporate tax changes. Uh, I think on the uh, tax provisions, where there are tax reductions, they're between House and Senate. Expensing is in between the two. Uh, you know, when it, as I recall, some of the major provisions of the bill. But there's no, but, Go ahead. Yeah. but there's no one item that changes the bill that dramatically no. uh, as it left the House. Well, Mr. Chairman, I, I won't pursue it. Uh, I, I have to say, I suppose it's fair to say the final conference report has 
uh, more spending cuts than the original House bill and has fewer taxes than the original House bill. And, uh, and it's also fair to say that the final package has more spending cuts than uh, what the President originally proposed. But not as much as the, uh, as the Republican substitute had, uh, which called for no new taxes and, uh, and uh, substantially more spending cuts. But I'm, I'm not going to pursue it any further. We do have some questions on the uh, entitlement process, budget okay. process, which I think Mr. Dreyer is going to deal with. And, uh, sure. But uh, Marty, I want to thank you for uh, uh, the, the strong effort that you put forth. And uh, again, we can't agree with your budget, but, but uh, congratulations on thank doing you. a good job. Mr. Bielenson. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. I, I really, too, I think, don't have any questions for the chairman. I just want, as our chairman has and as our friend Mr. Mr. Uh, Durek has, to commend Mr. Sabo for, for his uh, fine work. I've had the pleasure this year, along with our, our colleagues, uh, Mr. Gordon and Ms. Slaughter, of serving on the Budget Committee under Chairman Sabo. And as everybody has already testified, he's done a superb job. He's been very patient, very understanding, very fair, I think, to our, our friends on, on the other side. And it's uh, been a really good experience for, for all of us, uh, having served under him. He's, he's done very well by all of us, if I may say so. We're proud of the work he's done. And we shall be, some of us at least, supportive of his work on the floor tomorrow. Thank you. Tony, Tony would you yield? Of course. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I'd like to just, if Marty, if I could, follow up on a couple of things that sure. my friend from New York brought up. Uh, one, I think many of us would like to have seen spending cuts more and earlier. Uh, but. Uh, I wanted to get some idea. I think the alternative, uh, Bob Dole had an alternative. How does his spending cuts, as far as uh, when they come about, compare with your uh, proposal? Well, I think sort of, sort of the ironic thing, and my understanding is the Dole proposal had more cuts later on than the, the President's program and what's being passed oh, so, here. So, so Bob Dole's yeah. alternative, their cuts was even, even, even later? That's my understanding, and uh, then that is... And basically how cuts are going to work because they cumulatively build over a period of time. And the fact is we have significant cuts here, both in, uh, in entitlements and in, uh, in discretionary spending. They're real. Uh, the bill sets discretionary spending limits for the next five years at levels below the uh, 1993 level. In comparison, during the, the 1980s, uh, discretionary spending was growing at the average of about $25 billion a year. So the Dole alternative, his cuts were even later. That's and, my understanding. I guess, and the other thing, question I had, there's some concern about the uh, $240 or whatever uh, billion dollars in new spending. And, and if you could clarify oh. for me, and when we say spending, are, is that new roads or bridges or programs or are those uh, really cuts for, uh, in, in uh, taxes for people? Yeah, I don't think there's 240 of new spending right. measured in any fashion. That's approximately yeah. new revenues. Some of the, uh, there are, there's a modest amount of uh, new spending for, if, if for what I call the equity part of the program. Then there are tax expenditures, which are not ex direct expenditures by the governor, uh, government, but reductions in taxes due for, uh, for business incentive purposes, like the expensing provision for small business, targeted capital gains, extension of the R&D tax credit. All of those also cost the federal government, government revenues, but they do it through the tax code. So, it, so then is, is my understanding then that the so-called additional spending is not new, new spending in as far as products or people or anything, but rather it is just a, an accounting mechanism that says more money is going out than coming in because uh, we're providing tax breaks. For example, people under, under with a couple making $30,000 or more uh, would be paying less taxes. That's right. And so about 90% of the so-called spending really is tax cuts or loss of revenue by virtue of tax cuts for individuals and businesses. Is that the way that works? That is right. Although just so that we understand how different people put different numbers on papers of the earned income tax credit to make sure that uh, working families who are working uh, are not in poverty, in the event their uh, uh, credit exceeds their tax due, the, that excess credit is refunded to them. Some would consider that a reduction in the tax side of the budget. Others considered 
an increase on the okay. expenditure side. So, so those people that are making less than $30,000 whose taxes are going down, by virtue of cutting their taxes, that's thought of as spending. That's right. And those small businesses that are given incentives to, uh, to invest or their tax deductions allowing their, their uh, health insurance to be fully deductible, that so-called spending, I mean, that's what is called spending, which some of it, and sometimes mo it's most not. of us would think of as, as really cuts in, in, in their taxes. Okay, I just want to get clear on that. Thank you. Mr. Quiller. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I too want to congratulate you for bringing <coughs> one of the most difficult bills <coughs> this Congress has ever had. I don't say that uh, beyond the 30 years that I've served here. But they say this is the greatest tax increase in the history of the world. I think that depends on how you measure it. My understanding is if you <coughs> measure it as a percentage of gross national product, because our economy has been changing over time, that the tax bill in 1982 was actually larger as measured as percentage of gross national product. Well, that's per the perception anyway, and I think it is. You know, I served in the Navy to sink a ship. You either do it by torpedo or by a bomb. But I think that this ship is going to be self-destructive. And I think this bill be will be the self-destructive factor of the economy of this nation. That's my personal belief. I know you don't agree with me because you put in long hours on the measure. You followed the administration's guidelines all the way through. But we all know that tax increases slows down our economy, puts people out, to work, out of work. And I think we need to put people to work in order that they can pay more taxes, that this government can have more income. You don't strangle somebody who is productive. You want to encourage them to go forward for more production and, and for, more, for more employment. I can't imagine that we would have a retroactive tax increase to the first of the year. That's unprecedented. We've never been before. Gentleman Yield. Well, the gentleman yeah. Yield. Gentleman Yield. Be happy with you. Martin, uh, when, uh, what president had uh, what other presidents had uh, retroactive tax increases? I, I don't have the list in front of me, but a number, they've been done numerous times. And, uh, President Reagan? Yes. No, well, yeah. Well, the, well, the, were, well, the gentleman <laughs> here. Several, several <laughs> retroactive parts of the Reagan program in 1982. I didn't vote for him either. Oh, you didn't vote for him, okay. Well, well, well the gentleman here, just to keep the record straight. <laughs> All right. Mr. Uh, I think I have the time. Mr. Yeah. Would, would the gentleman yield for just gentleman one moment? For Mr. Frost. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Solomon and I have had this discussion once before, and I'm afraid he may have forgotten something. The Reagan tax bill of 1986, I voted against, I think Jerry voted for, had some very significant retroactive provisions in it involving real estate. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is certainly not without precedent. Uh, my preference would be that we not do these type things, but it clearly has happened before, and it was a major part of the Reagan 86 tax bill. And I believe that Jerry did vote for that one, though he since had, well, has gotten some religion and decided that was a bad if vote. I may reclaim my time. Mr. Quillen has the time. That was not a tax increase. Uh, yeah, no, yeah, yeah, I've now got sheets of paper. And <laughs> it was not a tax increase. Are you ready to answer the question, Mr. Chairman? Favorable. As to, the real estate industry, as to the real estate industry, it was a tax increase. So therefore, I think that I think what we're going to do is self-destruct this ship of state of ours, and I don't think that this ship is going to fly. I hope this ship doesn't fly. <laughs> <laughs> You're trying to burn your bridges at both ends. I think I have the time, but nevertheless, I'm, I'm glad to share in your laughter. 
<laughs> but I feel very strongly that this is a bad piece of legislation. I don't think it should be enacted. I think it's going to be a torpedo against the ship of state affairs. I can't conceive of it passing both houses. Maybe you're more optimistic than I am. Yes, I am, Mr. <laughs> Quillen, and uh, Well, why I, didn't you bring it earlier then? Pardon me? How many arms have you twisted? I, no, we, we've spent the day uh, working How on How many it. changes have you made? Well, we continue. Five and lost 14. Uh, we continue to keep working on the votes. Uh, time delay today was working out some technical problems. I have to say to my friend from Tennessee that uh, we're involved in a significant deficit reduction program. Uh, and we're doing that uh, to try and put our ho fiscal house back in order uh, to begin that process of deficit reduction. And we're, we've had the incredible growth of the 1980s and early 1990s. And uh, if one's going to be honest with the American people, to, to get that involves both the uh, changes in our expenditure patterns and spending reductions and the need for new revenues. Uh, clearly, that's something I think we have to do to build the base for long-term economic growth in this country. Well, I don't argue with your conclusion, but I think you're wrong. <coughs> if that's an argument, well, then I stand corrected. But to all the calls that I've had are adverse. The gentleman from New York said his calls were in majority adverse. And I don't see how in the world that this measure is going to fly. Hopefully it won't. I'm against it every step of the way. And I, I see that you're smiling. You know something that I don't know. No, I, you see, I've been hoping you might I've change your I've mind and we're, we're ready to vote for Conversations on the floor from your side of the aisle. And I know how close it was last time, and I hope it doesn't fly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Sable, how many Republican votes did you receive in the House when this bill went through originally? Zero. Zero. See, so that's why the gentleman doesn't think it's going to fly, because he's been spending too much time in the Republican caucus. Well, I hope that we, I hope that there will be no Republican votes for it. I, I think you're right. I don't think there will. And I hope yeah. there will be a lot of Democrats against it. If some, if some Republicans right saw the that? wisdom of our ways, we'd be happy to have their vote. I know the Democrats are optimistic, but just rue the day. <laughs> this measure passes. Well, the problem is that, that you're going to see a Republican House of Representatives and a Republican United <coughs> States Senate, and you're going to see a Republican back in the White House. Amen. Well, fortunately or not, the party and majority has to govern, and this is part of governing. Nobody likes to vote for a tax bill. Nobody likes to vote for anything that's going to make any constituents unhappy. But if you have to bite the bullet and stand up uh, to the blight, uh, and I'll mix a few more metaphors to get even with Mr. Quillen. <laughs> uh, and I think it's going to fly. Uh, Mr. Frost? Marty, could I ask one quick question, please? Sure. Before we get started. Sure. Go right ahead. Uh, just to, uh, I'd like to get one more clarification. There's some discussion about uh, the taxes being retroactive. Is that the case with the tax cuts also? That's the right. various small business uh, investment um, tax credits, um, R&D, things of that nature. Or, so is this applied across the board that the tax increases as well as the tax cuts are retroactive? Uh, there are some of the tax changes that are not retroactive in their inf in effective date, uh, but of uh, some of the tax but reductions that are in these, this bill, they are also So most of the, tax, most of the small yeah, business right. and other business type tax cuts are retroactive. That is accurate. Okay. I just, thank you. I just want to get that clear. Mr. Frost. Well, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm not going to take any time of the committee at this point. I may have some questions, uh, particularly uh, uh, after Mr. Dreyer asks his questions about rules changes. I may want to, uh, to weigh in at that point. Mm -hmm. I just want to uh, congratulate uh, Mr. Sabo not just only, not just for the good job he's done on this, but for his uh, successful uh, 
uh, job of managing the uh, baseball team last night, the Democratic baseball I team. I thank that, the gentleman. Uh, won thir the won 13 to 1 against the Republicans, and I hope that that, will, uh, that result will be repeated uh, tomorrow on the floor of the House of Representatives. Next time we'll send out our older, more mature players. <laughs> <laughs> if I might go back to Mr. Gordon's uh, question, I am told that some of the da tax reductions uh, affecting business are retroactive to June 30th of 1992. So they go back even further than, than the first of this year. Some of the tax cuts go back even till, till last year? That is accurate. Right. Gentleman from California. Thank Mr. you very Dryer. much, Mr. <coughs> Chairman. I congratulate you for your uh, diligence, Marty. Obviously, you've had a big task, and uh, you've worked very hard. Uh, like my colleagues on this side of the aisle, I'm not in agreement and don't count on my vote tomorrow for the package. Uh, we, shouldn't, we shouldn't change our whip count. No, no please okay. don't. Please don't. Uh, How is your whip count? Good. Good. Mm. Let me, uh, let me uh, touch on something that, that uh, really hits home with, uh, with a lot of us. You know, President Clinton talked last year in his campaign about the need for this country to, to come together. In his speech last night, he talked about bringing an end to business as usual and, uh, and that sort of thing. And one of the things that's always disturbed me has been this perpetuation of the sort of us versus them class warfare mentality, which often exists in this house. Uh, there are people who are, you know, take great pride out of pointing their finger at someone who may have been a little more successful than someone else and may make the determination that that's the person who should really be uh, hit the hardest. We have learned from that horrible 1990 Budget Enforcement Act, which, which I opposed and a lot of my uh, colleagues opposed. Unfortunately, President Bush supported that uh, when he was pushed into a corner by your predecessor and a number of other people on, uh, by saying that if, if he wanted to bring about spending cuts, he had to go along with tax increases. One of the items in that was the luxury tax. And the goal, of course, with implementation of the luxury tax was to increase by several billion dollars, I think it was about $4 billion, the level of revenues that would come in from those very wealthy Americans who were buying expensive automobiles and small aircraft and yachts and that kind of thing. Well, we have seen what happened since we implemented the luxury tax. The luxury tax is something that in this measure is uh, in large part repealed because it not only didn't increase the flow of revenues to the Treasury, it cost us tremendous sums of money because we've had to provide the welfare and unemployment benefits for those workers in the boat building industry and the aircraft industry who've been uh, laid off. So we've basically learned our lesson from the 1990 Budget Enforcement Act that this kind of provision uh, of this luxury tax has failed. This idea of pointing the finger at the rich and deciding that we're going to create a great flow of revenues uh, has not worked. And that's why I have a difficult time understanding the basis from which this entire package proceeds, because it, it is based on the same argument that failed in the 1990 Budget Enforcement Act. I wondered if you could respond to that. I, I don't think it's based on uh, well, the large same parts theory. Uh, frankly, uh, you're, if the gentleman's suggesting the bulk of the new revenues on the tax side are paid by the most affluent in this country under this proposal, the gentleman is right. However, it is also accurate that uh, the people who benefited the most from tax changes in the 1980s, the collective tax changes, were the most affluent in this country. Uh, it is also true and that they were... And as a byproduct, 20 million jobs were created. Well, the, and the other thing that happened was that that was a segment of the economy that also had significant income growth in the 1980s, when most American people had fairly stagnant income or declining income. And uh, what we're asking here are uh, new rates, which are not high by any historic proportions not high by comparisons uh, to, to other industrialized countries on the individual income side, uh, to make a, a additional contribution towards solving the deficit problem. I, I support it. I think it's fair. I think it's appropriate. 
I expect that's what will be argued out on the House floor and uh, uh, lots of discussion on the, and the tax side have, has really skirted that issue. Uh, the fact is that uh, any changes uh, in this uh, program for the middle income is very modest, basically the 4.3 cents uh, on the gas tax, which is uh, I think approximately $30, $35 a year. Uh, Per, per vehicle. Uh, Certainly not for my California drivers. Well, that varies around the country. Not, not as much as one might think. Mm -hmm. And uh, the bulk and the revenues here come from those people who, who have the highest income in this country, uh, who benefited by tax changes of the 1980s, benefited by the economics of the 1980s. I recall sitting and uh, listening uh, to the Reagan administration in uh, 1981 and telling us that uh, the virtues of supply-side economics uh, and uh, how great wonders were going to come from uh, giving tax cuts to the rich and how they were going to invest the money. Basically, we basically had an across the board Basically, tax you know, what, the, what happened the was uh, that they the spent side. the money, didn't invest it. No, the other combination of changes in the 80s uh, was not only the across the board cuts of 81, then changes Social Security taxation, which was limited in, in their impact. And uh, so I, I think there's no doubt there are certain things that are relative and that we can argue about. I, I don't think uh, one can quarrel over the fact that they were the people who got the biggest tax cuts of, uh, of, of the 1980s. And, uh, and frankly, we're reversing that, and that is the heart of the controversy as it relates to the tax. Well, I find it very interesting that the, the whole concept of the 1980s <coughs> has been rewritten by many people. I voted against the 1986 Tax Recovery uh, Tax Reform Act, the TRA, part because as they set this one uh, rate, I said it was going to continue to be increased and increased, and that's exactly what's happening this measure. And of course, in the 86 bill, one of the greatest mistakes, I believe, was eliminating the capital gains differential, which has created a great disincentive and cut the flow of revenues to the Treasury. The I'm, charged, the, I'm happy to yield, my friend. Yield at, at this point, you know, I just have to um, really take exception when I hear about the Reagan years and how the Reagan tax cuts created to this deficit. You know, when I came here in 1970, I was elected in 1978 with you, Mr. Sabo, and you know, the federal, the, the revenues coming into the federal coffers in 1979 and 1980 were $550 billion. $550 billion. All right. In 19, wait a minute now. In 1981, we rammed through the Reagan tax cuts, and in the next six years, we created 23 million new jobs, not 20 million new jobs. And you know what happened in those in that six and uh, uh, seven year period? Revenues coming into the federal coffers doubled to over a trillion dollars. But you know what happened? Congress not only spent the 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 the, uh, the double, in other words, the the uh, trillion well, the dollars. Gentleman, well, the gentleman they, yield on that right point, now, but I will in a minute. But they went on and spent additional uh, uh, money so that they we created the debt. We, the Congress, spent that money. And, and yet, I, we stand here and people say, well, those Reagan tax cuts created this deficit. That is absolutely wrong. Would, would the gentleman yield on that point? Well, I, you, I, I, the time. Time. I, I, I hate to rehash this argument every time the camera. <laughs> <laughs> Evidently, that's, that's the way we it's do going to work. We the here, too. <laughs> but, you know, you talk about, you know, the, the Reagan program having created so much more revenue. Wasn't it the Reagan program? Wasn't it the same President Reagan who, in fact, proposed deficits significantly higher than what were actually passed by the Congress throughout this entire time period? I'll, Didn't the Congress, in fact, I'll, I'll pass that. budgets uh, throughout this entire time period with deficits smaller than were proposed by the President? Let, let, let me uh, answer the gentleman if you would continue to yield. You know, everybody says, well, Ronald Reagan never offered a balanced budget. That's and, correct. Know, he and, never you know did. That is he true. talked about it every year, That's but he right. never well, you, offered you, one. You don't have the time. Just wait your turn. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. I did. <laughs> every, you know, every time that Ronald Reagan offered a, a uh, budget, it was a five-year budget, the same as any other president has to do, and it went from a budget figure in the first year down to a balanced budget in the fifth year. And every year, this Congress, uh, when Ronald Reagan would send in his budget, it would be dead on arrival. And I remember I was the only one, I think there were five of us that voted for one of the Ronald Reagan budgets one time, because everybody was afraid because it cut entitlements. 
You know, that's well, if, if, it, if, if the gentleman would yield, I, you're right. I never voted for one of those budgets because the deficit in those budgets was always higher than what I was willing to support. In order to vote for a lesser deficit, you had to vote for the budgets of the Congress. And, but in fact, in some of those years, the reason that nobody voted for the Reagan plan is that nobody on your side would offer it. Just the same way that you're approaching this budget picture this year with no one being willing like to, to offer, my friend, offer a real the appropriations bills that came out during the 1980s at levels that were significantly higher. They, they, they were not. They were not. They were lower than what the president asked for consistently. Let's go down and take a special order and continue this on the floor. Well, we, we, we've done that before also, but, but uh, being a new father, I'd prefer to go home than be out there doing a special order at 3 and 4 in the morning. <laughs> I have a couple of technical You're questions right. that I'd like to, uh, to pose here. The proposed rule that uh, we have before us here would self-execute the adoption of House Resolution 235, which was just introduced by uh, Chairman Moakley. It establishes special House procedures to deal with presidential direct spending messages. The question that naturally comes as a, as a byproduct of this, here we are anguishing over the reconciliation process. Uh, is it correct to conclude that with the self-execution of this resolution that we would see a two-step reconciliation process, one to deal with deficit reduction and the second to deal with the prospect of entitlement overruns? Uh, that could be accomplished uh, within the, in the process of reconciliation, but it requires us to deal with the issue. And what it is really structured to do is to you know, if, if, if one goes back historically and looks at the 1990 uh, agreement and why it had problems, uh, the, the bulk of the problems were because of a declining economy and reduced revenues. And there's some quarrel to what degree there were wrong estimates and computer errors and, 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 and people can quarrel about that. But as you look at the enforcement procedures, uh, discretionary spending basically stayed within the guidelines of the 90 agreement. But there was entitlement growth that went beyond the es estimates that uh, were estimated in 1990. And this process is set up to try and ensure that the President and the Congress has to take a look if the estimates that are currently being made for the entitlements in the future are being exceeded. Most everyone talks uh, in a generic way about dealing with this entitlement uh, problem. We, if we're going to really turn the corner on the deficit, we've got to deal with that question. And it seems to me that this process that we're talking about with this resolution, which would be uh, self-executed in the rule itself, uh, really does not tackle this question. And I'm, I'm wondering, uh, how you interpret um, the analysis of this as its direct effect on entitlement spending. I, I would use a different word. I, I think the bill itself it deals with some of the problems of entitlements. Uh, clearly, I, as I recall, the number is approximately $88 billion of entitlement reductions within this bill, modifications in Medicare being the biggest, some in retirement plans, uh, some in... Uh, in, uh, in um, Medicaid, but what this system sets up is not artificial choices <clears throat> for the future, but says if the numbers that are assumed and estimated this year are inaccurate, it sets in place a mechanism for the Congress and the President to come back and immediately begin with that, to deal with that overage, either by making a conscious decision that they want to up those caps or that they want to reduce them or that they want to find some method of paying for it. Uh, I think it is a significant step forward. And uh, I think, uh, again, looking historically, one of the problems with changes in entitlements, uh, they sort of creep up a little bit beyond estimates every year, and we tend not to go through this reconciliation process in a significant fashion every year. And if it's a three, four year span, uh, that sort of slippage a little bit year by year it's very difficult to, uh, to deal with at the end of a period of time. So I, I think it is a very useful and positive step forward. I, frankly, at first when uh, I uh, heard some of the proposals, how they were devised, was somewhat skeptical. I've become more convinced that it is a very important step for us to take. We, under this provision, we have this new direct spending process um, for the president. 
to utilize, but if Congress ends up uh, doing virtually nothing to address the entitlement question, then nothing will happen, is that? It, uh, what it does, it does not force uh, an outcome. It does force us to make votes on the issue. Okay. And I suppose, uh, I think that's ultimately where that responsibility rests, is with us to make judgments on a year-to-year -year basis, and uh, that's what we're elected to do. Well, you're a very persuasive guy, Marty. I still don't want you to count me in your whip check. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I frankly think this should, should be a provision uh, that you should like in the bill. Mr. Wheat. Mr. Chairman, just to congratulate the Chairman of the Budget Committee for a job I believe exceptionally well done. It's a difficult and arduous task that you have. Probably not a one of us uh, in the Congress and probably not a single American citizen would have written exactly this bill. But we're talking about almost $500 billion worth of deficit reduction. There is certainly room for, for some difference as to how you go about it. But overall, I think you have come up with a plan that can be supported on the floor of, of both bodies of, of the Congress and one that makes a serious effort about doing something about the deficit. And I've looked at this from every angle, and I haven't seen any magic to this process yet. You either have to uh, make spending cuts, which you have done significantly, or increase revenues. And when you increase revenues, I think the fairest way to do it is to increase revenues on those who can most afford to pay. Uh, you have done that, and in a way that it is not going to negatively affect the economy. I think the administration was very careful about that. And overall, you, you, you've done uh, an excellent job. It's a tough job. It's not easy for people on either side of the aisle to vote for this bill uh, because of the fact that, that it does involve some significant change in our current uh, tax structure. Uh, but it's something that needs to be done if the people who've been complaining about the deficit increasing for the, the last 12 years are, are serious about doing something. And, and I thank you for your work. I thank the gentleman. The gentleman from Florida, Mr. Porta Garth. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to say first that I have really no real objection to moving the White House to Arizona, but there are a few problems I do have with this bill and this rule, and I'd like to take some time. I uh, congratulate you on your argument that timeliness is the reason we cannot have uh, any... Neal, sure, certainly. Who, who is moving the White House to Arizona? Oh, that, we heard that there was an arrangement this afternoon, but uh, perhaps it's not true. No, it's true. There's concessions that were made to try and get some votes. Perhaps it wasn't the White House. Perhaps it was some other agency of government going to Arizona. I may have the wrong agency. It's hard to know. Social Security Administration. West Virginia? Yeah, yeah it's yeah. about time we took it out of West Virginia. Yeah. Well, I understand. <laughs> I thought it was Florida. Then. Senator Byrd has not been heard from on this, but the, uh, I'm not sure how it's going to play out. Anyway, right. I'm not concerned about that, as I said. What I'm really concerned about is this rule and some of the things we've got. And, and to say that, uh, you know, that it, it may not, we've got a timeliness problem. We've got this artificial uh, go on vacation date staring us in the face at the end of the week. Uh, the, the, the chairman has eloquently testified that this is probably the most significant uh, piece of legislation that's going to come before this Congress. It's certainly career-ending uh, if it's not handled properly. Uh, and I think there's a tremendous amount of uh, interest in it. We all know that because uh, Mr. Solomon's phones have been ringing and so have mine. And it seems that the longer this is out, the more questions there are. And of course, I'm uh, zero hour is uh, the time the president spoke and since that time. You'd be interested to know, I think, that my calls in the district were running about 50-50 right after the president spoke. In fact, while he was speaking, people uh, did respond to his call to uh, call their congressman. And, and that did happen. Uh, by this afternoon, we're running uh, very significantly. I'm not sure we're up to 10 to 1 opposed, but as more people find out about this, there is more doubt. And I think this process and the process of this general debate is going to be very important uh, to all those involved. And I agree. We do need change. But there's good change and there's bad change. Uh, and I think it's up to us to try and make sure that we understand the change we're getting and then we make that judgment. And I do have some specific questions. Uh, and I'm sorry that the timeliness is being used as the excuse on, on the, uh, the question of uh, whether or not we're going to have instructions on the recommittal. But I'll accept that because it's apparently a done deal. Uh, I wanted to, first of all, go to this question of the senior shock that uh, we're beginning to see down in our district, and of course the part of the world I represent has a great many senior citizens. We've uh, done some studies based on the numbers that were uh, previously in the bill, and we haven't got the latest numbers uh, for our seniors in the Social Security system, so these are not entirely accurate, but they are in the range. 
And we've got a study that confirms that 57% of the Social Security taxes paid under the plan are going to be paid by seniors making less than $75,000. Now, that's middle class America. And that very definitely belies the statement the President has made about middle class America. Do you have anything uh, that, that we want to say to the seniors that that's, uh, they're not reading it right? Yeah. I, swear, I, am not, I have not seen your particular Well, I'd study. be happy to I'd provide apply. the study. It would impact about 10 percent of seniors, and what it would do would make uh, their income taxes uh, uh, roughly equivalent to that of working couples uh, with the same income. Just in my district alone, so you understand the impact of this, uh, using the, the original figures that uh, we had on this, which was the 35,000 figures, which have been adjusted now, so this number will be a little smaller. It won't it's be quite as many. Four. Uh, okay, the number of affected households would be smaller. Just in my district alone, we've got 27,000 households affected. These are middle class people, believe me. These are not, uh, for the most part, uh, well-to-do retirees. These are fixed income people that are having trouble making it. Um, now, I realize that there are, there's plenty more uh, that goes into that, but I don't want to dwell on that, but that's an area uh, that's going to take a lot of explanation. There was another statement Just made. so we have an agreement, Surely. If, uh, if you had an um, elderly working uh, or an elderly couple with $60,000 income, uh, th their taxes under this agreement would be about sixty-six twenty-four. A working couple with that same income, uh, with uh, no change in their current taxes, would be paying $7,128, about $500 more for that working couple than the retired couple at $60,000 income. Uh, I, uh, I'll be very happy to share my figures with you, but you're out there looking for votes. Clinton surtax on the elderly, the 10 <clears throat> states who are going to pay over 60 percent of the increase in seniors, California, New York, Florida, and Texas, followed by uh, Illinois, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Ohio, Massachusetts, and Michigan. There's a fair number of delegates from those states, and I suspect they're going to have some problem with these numbers the same way I have if I were trying to defend them. But I will leave it, because I don't want to get in the, in the question that the, my colleague from Tennessee has raised uh, about whether or not these are tax savings uh, or taxes on the seniors uh, or whether or not they are uh, spending cuts, as they've been characterized. The fact of the matter is seniors are going to pay more, and that's going to go down hard. The second thing I want to point out uh, that I really had trouble in the area of camouflage last night. And I maybe mis misheard the President, or perhaps he misspoke, but I believe he said 180,000 of family income was, was sort of the cutoff point uh, in his remarks. I, I think is, uh, uh, for the change in the individual income tax rates, uh, it would be approximately 180,000 gross income. Yeah, now that is a, a, an interesting number. Uh, and I suspect that it is a carefully crafted high end of the bracket uh, camouflage number because what we pay on is taxable income. And do you know what the taxable income threshold is? That's 140 and uh, the rough average uh, for uh, to have that is a just gross income. One would need about 180,000 of gross income. Uh, that, of, that, of course, depends on how you're handling your affairs, but to be absolutely candid, when, when you're going to set a threshold on taxable income, you probably ought to give the taxable income figure, because we're talking about taxes. This is not about what your gross is, this is about what your taxable income is. Is that a fair statement? Well, I, I think most people uh, measure their income in, the, in gross income terms. I'm not sure they do, and I don't think they pay their taxes on that basis, or there will be a lot more business for the IRS and the enforcement people. But we'll, we'll leave the point because it's one I know is going to get plenty of attention on the floor tomorrow uh, and uh, across the country as we go along. Uh, there are a couple of other questions, and, and Mr. Chairman, if I'm going along too far on this, I, I, uh, I'll be happy because of timeliness. <laughs> But I think these are sort of important, and I, I, I'm going to try and make them as fair as I can. The gentleman has always been very uh, fair in his questioning, and uh, we will allow latitude. Gentleman. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
revenues that are coming in. We've also heard about cuts. Can you give us specific revenues that are going to come in in FY94 and tell me the specific amount of cuts, true cuts, that are going to happen in 94? I, I do not FY94. have a, a flow chart in front of me. Uh, okay. Obviously, uh, on uh, the discretionary side, uh, those uh, become cumulative over the years on the spending cut side. Uh, uh, those are frozen at below 93 levels, kept there for the five-year period of time. And I think the, that's... Uh, I, I, you know, the, the entitlement changes are written into this law in a variety of ways by a variety of committees, and we have their cumulative five-year uh, totals. Uh, uh, I do not at this point have the five-year flow, individual year-by-year year flow. <laughs> But they obviously, they accumulate as time goes on. They're deeper at the end of five years than they are at first. That's just obviously the way they're going to flow. There's no question. I think the gentleman from uh, Tennessee <coughs> properly pointed out that even President Dole's budget, which is not before us tonight, uh, has got its cuts in the out years. I think it's important that we be very frank about where those cuts are for a very simple reason. We never made it in the... Uh, 1990 Budget Deficit Reduction Act to the cut years. We only got the tax years. No, I, if I might, Mr. Chairman. Please correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, you know, the, the, the cuts that are written in here in, in changes in entitlement law are, are permanent, are changes uh, for the five-year period in entitlement programs. And uh, the same uh, with, uh, I was not in part of this process except voting yes and no in 1990. Uh, but those changes that were made uh, were made for X period of time, and uh, th those have um, been complied with. Well, my understanding, and the reason I bring this up, is that the $44 billion of these $496 billion deficit reduction cuts that we're talking about are, are actually left over from the Budget Deficit Reduction Act. Now, if that's you know not true... Well, they, uh, some of the changes in... Uh, the, 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 they cover the same two-year period because uh, that one went through 95 and we're starting this one in 93. Policy choices to hit uh, those uh, deficit targets are, are decisions that the current president and the current Congress have to make to hit those limits that we have to hit on uh, discretionary spending. I agree with you that we probably should be crediting the 44 billion dollars of the hard decisions that this Congress has got to make. I agree. But if you are going to gather in the credits for this Congress, then how can we use the same philosophy for future Congresses? Why aren't we also gathering in the debits? Well, That's the problem okay. we all have with these out-year cuts. No, let, let, let me uh, be very specific as it relates uh, to, for instance, uh, the, the discretionary spending uh, limits that we're setting at below uh, 93 levels and outlays, uh, those are written into those law, this law through, uh, through 98. Uh, they are going to have to be complied with uh, by the Congress. If uh, uh, just as uh, one of the issues we faced early on in our budget resolution this year was whether we changed the targets for 94 and 95 that were set by the 90 Act, and our decision early on was to comply with those, those, uh, those uh, targets. And as a matter of fact, in, uh, in the Senate, if uh, one would have tried to go beyond them, it would have involved a violation of the Budget Act and required 60 votes. I understand what you're saying, and I think you understand my point. I'm concerned that we're double counting the credits and postponing the debits in the way we're doing this. Um, and I think that the year that the hard decisions of the cuts are made, if that's the way we're going to do it, fine in the budget. Uh, if we're not going to do it that way, uh, we don't have to do it that way. But we ought to do it one way or the other and not count all the credits and postpone the debits because that doesn't give you an accurate picture. Um, well, that brings me to the next question to, to, with the seniors. It's a serious problem um, that I understand that, that the savings or the uh, additional tax revenues, however you want to look at it in terms of the Social Security side of this, are basically going to be used for deficit reduction. That is the theory here. That is the first time, in my understanding, that we have absolutely breached the contract with the senior citizens, people who have paid into Social Security, for those revenues not going back into the Social Security system. Now, I agree there's a benefit to reducing the deficit, but I also believe there's a higher priority of not using those funds for some purposes for which they were not intended or promised. 
I don't think uh, the tree tax treatment has been one of those historic uh, treatments uh, and promises. Uh, clearly, uh, where that payroll tax goes is uh, it's been very clear. Uh, where uh, where taxes go and uh, that impacts us, uh, and that depends on what other kind of income a senior might have. Uh, that clearly, I think, in a very logical uh, way, can fit for deficit reduction. I think it's going to be a hard. So, I have one last question, Mr. Chairman. You talk in terms about uh, good news here, uh, repealing the luxury tax, and I congratulate you for doing that, and all those involved, uh, all of us involved. Uh, I think it's great we're finally getting rid of that dog. My problem is, I understand that's going to be retroactive as well to the 1st of January. Is that true? Uh, that is one of the details of Ways and Means section. I think so, but I wouldn't guarantee it. Well, my, <laughs> I the reason I right. ask the question, uh, to be perfectly honest with you, is I want to know how they're going to do that. Is it going to be a tax credit? Is everybody going to get a check back in the mail? Uh, what's the cost of that? And is that cost going to get translated into the diesel tax, uh, which is, I understand, what's going to pick this up, which affects uh, the trucks and the boats and, you know, the people who use the diesel stuff, the farmers and uh, some other people who have got an interest in this? I cannot tell you the details of that. Okay. Well, we'll save that one for tomorrow. Uh, Mr. Chairman, you've been extremely generous uh, with me. And uh, as you can see, there are many uh, interested questions. And I, I assure you, every one of these questions has come from a constituent. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Bart Gordon, Tennessee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Chairman Slabo, as you um, ride around and you listen to the radio and you hear talk show hosts and people on talk shows and you hear different opinions here and there, you get a wide range of, of opinions as to what this uh, bill does and how it affects individuals. I know the hour is getting late, so I just want to real quickly try to uh, be able to find out how this is going to affect individuals so that I can know how to respond to my constituents. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's my understanding that if, if say, a typical couple, a family of four, if they're making less than approximately $30,000, they're going to get a tax cut. Those, that same couple, if they were making over $180,000, or an individual making over $140,000, would have an increase in their income tax. Now, is that, that correct? That is accurate. Then, would the gentleman yield just on that point? I'd just like to ask. Sure. What is that thirty thousand dollar level? Is that gross income, taxable income? income? I would assume. It, it, I assume that it would be your paycheck. It'd be your gross, wouldn't it? That's yes. what. That's what most folks judge their salaries by. I, is I'm just wondering. Is paycheck. that is that the figure that that yes. uh, is what is considered in this package here? I, that we should find that out. I, that, I would that imagine case? if you're using yeah, gross so. uh, income for the 180,000, you'd have to yeah, use yeah. gross for the 30,000. So, so it, what about it, the imputed great. rental value of a home, for example? Is that included in here? I know this may be a ways and means item too. Yeah, right. It wasn't food hard. stamps? Would food stamps be included in this? Is uh, I, part of the income? I, I cannot answer those questions. I'm just saying that as we yeah. throw these figures out, Bart, it seems to me that we've got to take everything into consideration into the mix here. And I just think there's some questions that relate to it. And I just want to be very clear on the numbers. Well, there's not many people that are making $30,000 are getting food stamps, I don't think. But so let me just try to... Well, there may be people who are maybe not making $30,000, but if you include imputed rental income yeah. and a wide range of other factors, they may. Well, let's say, okay, well, let's... Uh, let me do, we'll go back. If you're through, I'll... I'll no, thank I'll, you very much for yielding. But, but go ahead. Okay. Now, so let's see. So again, if, you know, just so I can explain to folks that call me, I want to be able to get this correct. Now, it's my understanding that if you're a couple, let's say a, a typical family of four, and you're making approximately $30,000 a year, which I assume would be your gross, what your, your paycheck is, then you get a tax cut. But if you... It, but then that's, say, a same couple of, of four making over a hundred and eighty thousand dollars now they would have a tax increase that's right and if you were a single person making over hundred forty thousand dollars they would have they would have a, an, an income tax increase that's right okay now then i guess you've got those folks that are between thirty thousand dollars and hundred and eighty and as i understand it the only tax that will be affect them will be the four point three uh, cents uh, a gallon gas tax 
which amounts to what about 28 on the average 28 dollars a year per, per, per driver per, per vehicle okay so that so that's 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 the tax liability so I can answer that now I also have folks that are calling me for, uh, about concerns about small business which I think is very legitimate and again you hear different things so I want to see if this is correct it's my understanding that about 90 percent of the small business owners are eligible for a tax cut by virtue of the different um, uh, you know, investment tax credits and capital gains and things of that nature. Is that, is that right? That 90% of the small business uh, owners are eligible for a tax cut? That's my understanding. I, the gentleman's accurate. And then about 4% of the small business owners then are projected to have tax increases. And I assume those are the ones that have incomes of over 140 or 180, depending on whether they're married or single. That's right. Okay, I just wanted to be able to to, to put this in human terms, what it meant. Thank you. Uh, well, the general, you know, I'd just like to ask, why is it then that the National Federation of Independent Business and all these other small business organizations, I just saw one on the news earlier this evening, to come out strongly opposed to this measure because they're convinced they're going to see an increase in their tax burden. I, I, just, I was reading also, as I said, you know, you can listen to the radio and hear different things. There were eight uh, small business organizations that were listed that support this. Do you have that? those eight businesses, small business associations that Nobody's support this? Nobody's ever heard of them. I don't uh, well, have that list with me, but obviously for most small they've been businesses, in the last week. this bill has significant benefit for them. Uh, what what did the Wall Street Journal, I guess the Wall Street Journal uh, is a pretty fair-minded publication. Did they have, have they said anything about how this is going to respect, respect, uh, affect small business? Well, there was a story in the Wall Street Journal uh, recently that uh, indicated there had been significant distortion of how this uh, program impacted most small businesses. And the fact uh, was that most small business uh, would benefit substantially from the passage of this program. And I might add that so the Wall Street Journal, the Wall Street Journal discussed that 90% of the small businesses I that was would be eligible article, for tax that, cuts. Is that what it was? That analysis. Okay. And I must add that one additional impact clearly of this program is that it's had a significant impact on interest rates in this country. Uh, and I suppose we should not talk about how this impacts ourselves. Frankly, I was one of those thousands of Americans who refinanced my home this spring. And uh, I think uh, that's happened to thousands of Amer other Americans. And uh, that also has impact for small businesses. They borrow money uh, uh, for investment in, in their small business. Thank the gentleman yield. I just wanted to ask, just follow up on one one point that you made here. You're right. I just have a letter here from the National Federation of Independent Business. They say the increase in personal tax rates will affect a relatively small segment of the small business community. But the important thing to realize, and they go on to say, is that that segment that is effective happens to be the fastest growing, and it is the one segment of the small business. Uh, community which is creating jobs if, would then I think that so as I understand it we'll ask the chairman since he would put this bill together uh, those that four percent of small business that would be affected is only on their income over hundred and eighty thousand dollars that's accurate and so if they were to hire some a new employee that would be business expense so that wouldn't affect their income that is accurate. if they were to buy new equipment that wouldn't increase, you know, necessarily increase their income. I mean, that comes off well, the business. Under, under this question. bill, they would increase the amount they could expense in the first year. Yeah. So, um, uh, again, they're not affected unless they're making over uh, over $180,000. And if they want to hire a new employee, then that comes off their the expenses. That's and right. so that certainly wouldn't, wouldn't affect them either. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, you've done an outstanding job uh, with all these tough questions, and, uh, and as far as the, some people talking about rushing this thing through, how long have you been working on this budget bill? Huh. Started, uh, I suppose, in uh, January, in the January 1st. I think we got the President's message in uh, middle mid-February, and it's been fairly steady and since. And you've had many, many meetings every week? Lots of meetings, and uh, good committee to work with. Uh, you have three members, Mr. Bielens and Mr. Frost, Mr. <coughs> Gordon, who are all very good members of our committee and who we're happy to have. Thank you very much. Mr. Thank Chairman. you. Mr. Chairman, I don't have a, any question, but with all of your work and all of your compromising, 
Do you think you have a product that will fly? I think so. I, I, I think it would be a major step forward for the, the Congress and the country if this bill passes and, and signed into law by the well, President. Why Thank in you. The world, to all, uh, all of the comments I've heard is that it's going to sink the ship of state. I don't think that's uh, accurate. I, I think this is a, a very a necessary step forward for this country to bring our fiscal house in order. With all the taxes increases proposed. Well, it's combination spending cuts, revenue increases uh, designed to significantly reduce the deficit in this country. And I thank you, Mr. Chairman, for your courtesy and uh, and uh, for your dealing with this rule. I thank you very much. Well, I, I thank you very much uh, for your endurance and also for your uh, ingenuity in uh, working some of the, the tough uh, pieces of this uh, program out. Thank you very much. Nick Smith of Michigan. The uh, next uh, witness uh, would be the Honorable Nick Smith of Michigan, who is a member of the Budget uh, Committee. Mr. Smith. Mr. Chairman, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, uh, Mr. Weed, I'll try to do this uh, in, in five minutes so you can get home. Uh, as a conferee, uh, uh, the uh, decision-making process was very interested. I supported uh, uh, some of the provisions in this conference report. I think part of the positive note is that the Republicans and Democrats agreed that we've got to get a handle on deficit uh, uh, spending. This proposal reduces what we might have had in deficit spending, deficit uh, uh, overspending by about $500 billion. But even though it reduces where we might have been if we kept on the crazy spending pattern that we've had for the last 15 years, uh, where we end up is uh, increasing the public debt by $1.8 trillion over the five years of this proposal. We increase, that's an average, by the way, of, of uh, $365 billion increase in public debt per year. And so what I say is a billion dollars for a day, for each day, for the next five years, that we're going deeper in debt. So we've got to do a little better maybe on deficit reduction uh, than, than where we go in this conference report. We're increasing uh, uh, spending. We have spending cuts. Some of those spending cuts are tough, most of them on military. But uh, every spending cut is is more than overbalanced by spending increases so that net spending uh, goes up faster every year than inflation. We increase spending approximately $300 billion over the five years of this proposal. Now, I'm concerned where we end up in what happens in revenues. Uh, several years ago, this Congress uh, passed a law that said that we should have all of the information available in a mid-session economic report and that should be available to this Congress by July uh, 15th uh, before we make the final decisions on the budget. The law says the President will provide Congress by July 15th of each year his new economic analysis and projections of where the economy is going and how it might affect the budget before Congress has to vote on that budget. Here's some of the problems that I think we should consider. In the first quarter of this year, we had, uh, we had uh, economic growth of six-tenths of a percent, 0.6 percent economic growth in the first quarter. In the second quarter, we had economic growth of 1.6 percent. So the average of the first half of this calendar year uh, is, uh, uh, where are we, 1.1 percent. Now this budget is predicated on a 3 percent, 3.1 percent average growth uh, for the whole year. And so the revenue projections coming in uh, are going to make a difference on how far we go in the hole. And so one thing that concerns me is both the Congressional Budget Office that normally preside, uh, presents their economic forecast to Congress and the President who is required by law to do it by July 16th haven't done that. So we're making these decisions in the next 72 hours or however long it takes us Friday night. Uh, without that kind of information that seems to me would be something we we'd want to insist on because a lot of us are going to make the decision on this budget based on whether we really uh, reduce the deficit. Are we really going to reduce deficit? Let me give you some CBO numbers on what happens 
if this tax increase uh, has a negative effect on the economy. A 1% reduction in economic growth is going to result in an additional $366 billion of deficit. So if already we know that this year is going to be more than 1% behind what we predicted, unless it jumps from 1.6% uh, growth in the, in the second quarter up to over 5% growth in the last two quarters of this year. So we can't make the projection. We're going to be 1% under this year. If we were to be 1% under, under for the whole five years, it would add $366 billion to the deficit. If we have a 1% increase in unemployment, and we're predicting unemployment in this five-year budget at 5.7%, we're at 7% now, if we're 1% over that 5.7%, that's going to add another $286 billion worth, worth of deficit. Interest rates. Who knows where we're going on interest rates and inflation? Uh, Greenspan is, is saying that he can't reduce interest rates. If we have a, an inflation, which might be possible, interest rates are going up. If interest, for every 1% that interest rates go up, we add another $155 billion dollars to the deficit in this proposal. So it just seems to me that, that having the best information possible is very important. I mean, I'm a, I'm a freshman, I'm a farmer uh, from Michigan, uh, but it seems to me that, that somehow leadership would in, uh, insist that the Congressional Budget Office and would insist that the President give us that kind of information to make a decision on because it so much affects what a lot of us think is important is how far we go in deficit reduction. So I'm, Mr. Chairman, I, I'm asking sort of a, a long shot request that, that, that you in leadership of this Congress consider delaying a decision, delaying forcing the members to vote on this bill until we have that information from CBO and from the President. Thank you very much, Mr. Uh, you don't sound like a farmer. I think you've uh, had a great presentation. Well, I think you, uh, thank you. When I, when Mr. I, when Chairman, my father when was I get farmer, excited. and uh, <laughs> let me say, as well as almost all of my family, and uh, farmers can sound as well as anyone else. We work I, harder at and it. And I think they do. Uh, do you have an MBA? No, sir. Okay. No, sir. I'm... All right. Mr. Derrick? I don't have any questions. I would observe you don't sound like a farmer either. Mr. Solomon. Well, I don't sound like a southern farmer. I sound like a Michigan farmer. You don't sound like any kind of farmer I've ever heard. Uh, Nick, I want to invite... Uh, I've got 2,000 acres. I milk cows. I milk cows two weekends ago and planted corn. Uh, I want to invite Butler Derrick to come up to the uh, Hudson Valley of New York State because you sound like every farmer in, uh, in the Hudson Valley of New York State to me because you make a lot of sense. But what, what you said is absolutely right. <laughs> and we are voting blind. We've got a, uh, a bill that's a foot thick, and I'm going to tell you something. After we, vote, after we vote on this thing, this is a quarter of it right here. Uh, after we vote on this, every farmer in this country is going to be so upset, uh, I, it's going to be hard to go back home and face them uh, if you voted for this. But, you know, we talked about, and I think uh, my good friend Tennessee brought this out, he was trying to say, well, you know, just because we have retroactive tax increases, we shouldn't worry about that because we have retroactive tax cuts as well. Well, the truth of the matter is when you analyze what that means is you've got a tremendous amount of retroactive tax increases in heavy dollars, and you have a very minute, small amount of retroactive tax cuts. And those people that are going to benefit from the retroactive tax cuts <clears throat> are not those that are creating jobs. Those that are going to be affected by the retroactive tax increases are those that create 75% of all the new jobs in America. That's right. And that's why we're voting blind on what we are here. We can't hear over here. Uh, does you have some water, Mr. Chairman? Uh, the committee will be in order. Okay. Uh, the, uh, the problem is that uh, we don't have those figures from CBO from July 15th, and uh, we really don't know what the interest rates are going to be or what the revenues are going to be. But the problem is that if we enact this reconciliation package before us, is exactly what you said. In any one of the five years, we are going to run, continue to run huge deficit levels deficit levels ranging anywhere from $240 billion a year up to the $355 billion if interest rates don't go up. And if interest rates go up, which they're going to be if the economy goes sour from this kind of reconciliation package, 
then those deficits are going to be annually $400 billion. Yeah, see, the President said last night, uh, if, uh, if, if, what I heard the President say is, is if the, let's get this passed because the uh, economy is vulnerable. The only way that we can have this kind of a tax increase on the economy, it seems to me, uh, is if interest rates stay down low to offset that tax increase. So we're so dependent and so vulnerable on, on, on our look into the future. That's why it seems, I, I'm, I hope other people are unhappy that the President has, has not complied with the law and given us this information uh, because it seems so important. I'd be glad to yield my good friend. I'll try to sound more like a farmer, Mr. Durr. I, uh, I, I don't mean to imply that you, you're not a farmer. We're just having a little fun. If you've got a couple of thousand acres of land and some cows, you're certainly a farmer. Uh, but, you know, on, on this interest rate, and, and I, I believe, and I don't want to misquote him, but I believe when um, uh, Alan Greenspan was before the, uh, the Congress uh, here recently, he, uh, he gave credit to the fact that uh, this plan might be enacted. One of the reasons that we were having a low interest rate, lower interest rates, and as I understand it, uh, last night after the president's speech, the uh, interest rates took a, another dip. Uh, those of us who are for the plan would like to think that that, uh, that, that had something to do with it. You know, the, uh, the gas tax, at least in my state, and I uh, did this through the Tax Commission, also the Highway Department. The average uh, South Carolinian, after it was fully implemented, it would cost probably about 50 cents a week. But on the other hand, uh, if someone who owned a had a hundred thousand dollar mortgage on, on a home was paying nine and a half or, or 10 percent, as most mortgages were a short time ago, and, and reduced that down to what you could expect to get today, would probably save about 175. Uh, dollars a month on that mortgage. So, you know, I, I think that uh, the, the financial market, certainly the stock market, the bond markets and others have been uh, uh, very pleased uh, with the prospects of, of, of what, of what, I, me, what we respond? might do. Yeah, certainly. Yeah, you, you know, I, I'm not sure how much government influences what they do out there in the real world in terms of business. Little incentives do make a difference in research and development, whether you buy new machinery and equipment, whether you have some kind of an investment tax credit, that's part of the decision. Uh, but but to, to the extent uh, of, of how the economy has reacted in this first six months, uh, the Congressional Budget Office estimated growth at 2.5 percent. Uh, we ended up uh, in the first half of the year at 1.1 percent. So somehow the economy has deteriorated in, in the first six months. Uh, you, you can't blame that on, on government any more than you can cred credit government with that, with the interest rate. I mean, we're, we're vulnerable now. Somehow, uh, if the product, if the potential for producing a good product at a competitive price isn't there, then, 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 then business isn't going to expand. Government's job, it seems to me, is just to do everything possible to get out of the way of business and, and let, it, let it operate based on the market rather than disincentives and incentives that we put to it. Well, I, I will tell you quite frankly, Mr. Smith, uh, that there are several hundred million people out there in this country that uh, 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 Republicans and Democrats that uh, I think would probably disagree with you on that, that government does, does not have any impact uh, on, on, on the way the economy no, I, I, goes. I, I, they have impact. Sometimes it's not as much as we think it is here in well, Washington. Well, I mean, that's just a matter of judgment, frankly. But thank you very much, uh, Farmer Smith. Yeah. Mr. Quillen. You know, you're not only a farmer, but... Uh, I don't think it's going to fly. You're very, very knowledgeable. <laughs> and I agree with you, your logic. Most people overlook our national debt. But when our national debt goes up, our deficit also increases because we have to borrow money to satisfy our national debt. That's right. And I haven't heard that discussed before. Well, on our public debt, it's $270 billion a year that we're shelling out. That adds to the complexity of the problem. But if we don't control it, it seems to me that it's just progressively getting worse. There's no question about it, and I think this whole proposal before us, the budget resolution, reconciliation, 
really is a farce. I mean, there's no way that this country can survive with the tax increases and with the projections involved. I think it's the beginning and it sets the stage for greater deficits and a, and a higher debt for this country. I, I don't see any other way around it. See, he, we talk about the effect of government, and I, 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 maybe I'm talking too long, but here is government. If you, if you can imagine all of the money out there that's available for somebody to borrow for homes, to go to college, for business to expand and buy new equipment, here is government reaching in and taking almost a third of all of the money that's available to borrow in this country. Uh, and we spend it for our overindulgence as a government uh, and make future generations pay for it. So I think there's, and I guess we've all agreed that, that there's a danger in this deficit spending and we've got to stop something. Mr. Gentleman, you'll just, just be glad to hear. You know, Mr. Smith, I, we all agree with that, that, that we need to reduce the deficit. I don't think anyone uh, disagrees with that. Uh, but, but I think what we disagree with is who has, who is willing to take the initiative to do it and then how to do it. And, and that, of course, is what we're discussing here. I don't uh, suggest that any of my friends on the other side of the aisle don't, don't feel that reducing the deficit is a very important matter, as you do. Well, about, I'll quit talking. About three and a half months ago, I was before this committee, and I had a budget resolution, a substitute budget resolution that, that actually balanced the debt in five years. Uh, and I asked permission to take that to the floor and of course, a lot of people thought it was drastic to balance the budget in five years, but I consider it a crisis, and that's why I wanted to make a couple comments tonight. Well, Mr. Chairman, uh, all the tax increases enacted, <coughs> they've never been productive, they've been counterproductive. And I, this is my 31st year, and this is the greatest tax increase in the history of the world. I don't think it's going to solve our problems. It's going to stagnate our economic recovery, in my opinion. It's going to be a thorn in their side forever. And it's just the beginning of other measures that really are going to stifle our economy. So you've been, uh, you, you've been a very enlightening rod all of us tonight, and I wish that others could hear what you have said. And I hope you do Thank that you. on the floor. You promise? Uh, that's, uh, yeah. if, if, uh, if Mr. Sable will give me some of his time. Uh. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Quillett. That's all, Mr. Mr. Chairman. Frost, Mr. Dreyer. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I can assure you that Mr. Solomon will gladly give you some, uh, some time to uh, to make your case there. You make a very good argument. We should have the information that the law requires that we have as we face this extraordinarily historic decision. And I think that uh, as we charge towards this August recess, uh, clearly uh, as we make a decision which is going to have such a phenomenal impact on uh, virtually all Americans, it seems to me that we should have every, every bit of uh, of uh, evidence before us before we make that decision. So thank you for your effort and thanks for being here. You know, there's, there might be two or three that if we found out there wasn't going to be deficit reduction in this bill, there might be two or three that would change their minds and vote no. And so you can't help but be suspicious why the information isn't available to us. Next. David. Mr. Goss of Florida. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, very much. Uh, Mr. Smith, uh, I found your testimony uh, very illuminating, very consistent with the type of uh, concerns that people in my district and elsewhere as I go around our country uh, are expressing to me. I wanted to change the subject just a little bit uh, right on the issue of this rule. This rule has got a self-executing provision in it. You're on the Budget Committee. Can you explain to me that self-executing provision and no, show sir. me on a chart exactly what it does? No, sir, I can't. Can anybody on the Budget Committee do that? Uh, I think you asked that question to the Chairman, is that correct? Didn't you? I didn't ask the Chairman because I didn't want to embarrass him. I thought it was because you ran out of time. 
Well, that was true too, Mr. <laughs> Chairman. I knew I was about to run out of time if I asked that question. The gentleman so yield. Have it yield. The gentleman yield. <laughs> Why don't you ask the Rules Committee members, because uh, those rules changes should have come out of this committee. They were never originated from this committee. We never held hearings on it. And nobody on this committee knows what they're about either. Well, I reclaim my time. I was going to save the question until we went into executive session. Um, it's a good question, however. Uh, Mr. Smith, I do want to ask you another matter. Um, you're, you're aware of the uh, leading economic indicators. Uh, I'm sure you know on the Budget Committee that we've had a recent report on that. Uh, those indicators are flat. They've been characterized as discouraging, uh, in fact, and that's uh, probably as good as it gets. Do you know uh, as well that there have been polls taken uh, by CNN, USA, Gallup polls uh, recently, uh, some as recent as last night? Are you aware of that? I, I'm aware that subject. there's been polls taken, and I did call uh, both the Congressional Budget Office, I called the uh, Office of Management and Budget, and I called the Council of Economic Advisors. They all indicated that uh, the economy is not growing uh, as fast as they uh, had earlier anticipated. Do you know that the polls that came out today think this is what the people in America think? Now, there's a margin of error, a percentage in these polls. It's a couple of percent, I'm sure. But these are quality polling. You'd be interested to know, and I'd like your observation on this, because this is a budget plan, and you're on a budget committee. 31% think the budget plan will reduce the deficit. 54% think it will not reduce the deficit. What do you think? I think there's a great deal of confusion about in, with the American people of what uh, uh, deficit means. Uh, in Washington, we Fair use question. the word uh, to mean a reduced uh, a level of spending from what we might have spent. Uh, but uh, uh, the actuality of our bragging about a deficit reduction is uh, a, a dramatic increase in net spending and a dramatic uh, uh, indebtedness of this country going from 4.3 trillion to 6.2 trillion in just the next five years. 37 percent think the budget will improve the economy. 49 percent do not think it will improve the economy. Again, these are today's uh, releases. Uh, is that consistent with your belief on what well, you've told us? In, in Michigan, we lived through a similar situation. We went into the early 80s with a sluggish economy. Uh, the current administration, the governor and, and the House and the Senate decided to increase uh, income taxes by 38 percent. Within the next two years, we saw jobs and business flood out of Michigan into other states where they thought they could make more money. The danger of increasing the, the, this kind of taxes uh, nationally is, is uh, the potential for businesses to go to other countries. So I think we've got to be very uh, gentle about doing that. And absolutely, I feel that uh, uh, the increase in taxes tends to deteriorate the economic expansion. Well, the final point on this is there was a poll taken last night, an NBC News poll, that asked pretty much the same question as the other Gallup poll question, which was, uh, should we oppose or favor this Clinton economic program? And I think the president did a, <coughs> excuse me, a very fine job of articulating the best possible uh, exposure he could give to his plan. I think he did a very good job of it. Um, and at the high point, I would say, the best this is going to get, it isn't going to get any better. Uh, the poll last night, uh, the NBC poll, uh, came out 36 percent in favor of the Clinton economic program and 45 percent opposing it. And the, the previous Gallup poll that came out today, which was not taken at that peak time, showed 37%, uh, uh, excuse me, 44% thinking that the plan should be voted down, which is uh, close to the 45% who said so after the president spoke, and 33% who want it passed. So those are very, very clear indicators to me that not only are the people in the business community, not only are the people making decisions about our economy, but grassroots America, our farmers and everybody else, are very, very concerned. I congratulate the president on his initiative. As uh, Butler Derrick has said from South Carolina, he's right. Big applause for initiative. But putting it in reverse is going backwards when you want to go forwards. And it seems to me we ought to be rethinking this. And that's why I think your advice is good for this Rules Committee. And I thank you for it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Barnett. Mr. Wheat. Mr. Bart Gordon. Lots of questions, and, and, but uh, 
Uh, Mr. Chairman, I think the, uh, the evening is running late. I appreciate this testimony and uh, hope that we can get on and try to uh, work through this project. Ms. Slaughter. Thank you. Thank Mr. you very Chairman much. Committee, thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. No other witnesses to appear on H.R. 2264. The chair will be in receipt of a motion. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Derrick. I move the committee grant the conference report on H.R. 2264 a rule waiving all points of order against the conference report and against its consideration. The rule provides six hours of general debate with one hour equally divided and controlled by the chairman and ranking minority member of the Ways and Means Committee. One hour for the purpose of closing debate equally divided and controlled by the chairman and ranking minority member of the Budget Committee and 20 minutes equally divided and controlled by the chairman and ranking minority member of each of the 12 remaining committees of jurisdiction. The conference report shall be considered as read. The rule provides one motion to recommit and may not contain instructions and on which the previous question shall be considered as ordered. The rule provides that following disposition of the conference report, no further consideration of H.R. 2264 shall be in order except by a subsequent order of the House. Finally, Section 2 of the rule provides that upon the adoption of the rule, House Resolution 235 is considered adopted. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Dry. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I move that we strike the provision that self-executes the adoption of House Resolution 235, the last one which Mr. Derrick just mentioned, which deals with this entitlement process review procedure. I had an exchange with the committee chairman on that issue, and it seems to me that it's not appropriate for us to, uh, in this conference report, rule proceed with that. And I move that we strike that provision. Uh, you've heard the motion. Any discussion? On the motion of the gentleman from California, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. 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 The no's appear to have Chairman, it. Chairman, we have a record vote on that. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Derrick? No. Mr. Dillon? No. Mr. Cross? No. Mr. Bonnier? No. Mr. Hall? Mr. Wheat? No. Mr. Gordon? No. Mr. Slaughter? No. Mr. Solomon? Aye. Mr. Quillen? Aye. Mr. Dry? Aye. Mr. Goss? Aye. Mr. Chairman? No. On this matter, four members having voted the affirmative, eight in the negative, the motion of the gentleman from California is not adopted. Mr. Chairman? Mr. Dry. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, in light of that vote that we've just taken, um, I'd like to offer what might be a more balanced procedure here. And what it would do is simply strike the self-executed provision that's referred to on this House Resolution 235 and provide for a separate debate and a separate vote on this specific resolution, which uh, is scheduled to be self-executed here. Any discussion? Mr. Chairman. Is, that, is, that, uh, uh, is it possible that we could maybe make this an order, which is sort of a balanced no, uh, compromise position on the, that? The chair received the gentleman's uh, motion. Yes. Mr. Chairman, uh, under the discussion on this, uh, it, it's quite apparent that this provision uh, is going to be included, that we're going to have this self-executing prov provision, despite these uh, reasonable attempts to uh, take them out. It, it does seem to me that this is the Rules Committee. And it does seem to me that eventually somebody's going to have to be able to explain exactly what this is. And it, I, in all seriousness, would like to see our staff present us a, a chart showing us the flow of how legislation works. I've read the words. I tried to read this darn thing. As far as I can see, it's a great big circle. It gets us back to square one uh, after a lot of hoops and, uh, and, and mirrors and deflections. Uh, I really would like to see our staff come up. It doesn't have to be done tonight because I don't expect anybody is really going to be able to explain this thing or have to uh, when it gets to the floor. But uh, before we have to do business under it, I'd sure like to know what it means. Well, generally it means because of the bird rule, 
matters were dropped out in the Senate, and this is getting around the bird rules, so the House rules would be put back in so that the House could work its will. Mr. Chairman, I understand the purpose and the intent. It's what I want to know is how it works. The mechanics of it are, are a little bit puzzling, uh, at least to me, and I admit are I'm a newcomer. Have, are we going to have two reconciliation uh, bills that we'll have to consider if this process goes into place? No, one. Well, I, I mean, I... That's what's not clear. Exactly. I would hope that, that, uh, that we would have just one. Frankly, I wish we had no reconciliation bills, but it seems to me that there is a lot of confusion on this, Mr. Chairman, as to exactly what is going to be brought about, because many people who have looked at this and are expert on it have concluded that there would be two, one to deal with the uh, deficit reduction component and the second to deal with this entitlement question. Well, I was informed it could be part of the same reconciliation bill. Well, it's just, there, there's a great deal of confusion about this, obviously. I mean, you, you understand that. I mean, it's just been introduced today, and, and we're not faulting you, but, but it, we'd just like to be able to, as Mr. Goss has said, have some kind of indication as to what this is. And that's what I'm calling for in this motion that I've just made. It calls for a debate which would allow members of the House to have the opportunity to have these charts to which we've referred to explain the process of this House resolution on the floor. And then after that very clear explanation is given by the proponents of it, we'd have the chance to have a vote on this issue. And that's what I'm pushing for with my motion here. And it seems to me that it's a very balanced way to deal with a question that we're faced with up here. The, uh, Mr. Derrick, this is the same provision exactly that was incorporated in the bill that passed the House originally. And all this is doing is giving us back the House rules and not having to deal with the Senate situation. Well, that Mr. really Chairman, clarifies things. Is, was that, is the gentleman referring to the 3 a.m. delivery that we passed at 4 a.m.? Uh, was it that particular progeny, which I don't think has been fully understood yet? Uh, I uh, did not keep time. Question comes in the motion of the gentleman from California. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. No. The no's appear to have Chairman, the motion. Can we have a record vote on this amendment, which would simply allow debate on the House floor? <laughs> Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Derrick? No. Mr. Beelins? No. Mr. Frost? No. Mr. Bonnier? No. Mr. Derrick? No. Mr. Hall? Mr. Wheat? No. Mr. Gordon? No. Ms. Slaughter? No. Mr. Solomon? Aye. Aye. Mr. Goss? Aye. Mr. Chairman? No. On this matter, four members having voted in the affirmative, eight in the negative, the matter is not adopted. Mr. Solomon. <coughs> Mr. Chairman, uh, in all uh, seriousness, uh, we have here a, this, this uh, conference report, and it really is. It's, uh, it's several thousand pages. I don't know how much the thing weighs, but... Uh, the truth of the matter is it's an unusual reconciliation package, and the reason it's, uh, it's unusual is that uh, uh, myself being one of the conferees, and I think you were too, uh -huh. uh, we Republicans were invited to the opening session of the conference, and uh, I was there for 15 minutes. And during that 15 minutes, we had four opening statements by the two Democrats and two Republicans and uh, with whatever they had to say. And from that time on, I was never invited back, nor was any other Republican. And uh, this entire several thousand page document was put together, you know, behind closed doors uh, uh, without any consultation with the other party uh, in the House, the Republican Party. And because of that, uh, I'm going to make a motion which would uh, allow us to have our uh, traditional motion to recommit with instructions. And uh, I say that again because there are issues that have come up during this debate here uh, dealing with scope, and scope meaning that uh, there are certainly issues in here that go far beyond what the House voted on and go far beyond what the Senate voted on, and yet we don't know what they are. And uh, at one time, uh, our good chairman uh, of the Budget Committee, Mr. Uh, 
Sabo said there were no scope violations. And then it just uh, was brought out that there was a Social Security uh, tax uh, or uh, tax increase on Social Security benefits uh, that was changed that does go beyond the scope. And we would like the opportunity to have at least one opportunity to offer a motion to reconvent with instructions that, that might uh, correct that scope problem or any other scope problem that we might discover uh, over the next uh, 12 to 14 hours. And we're going to have our budget staff working on this uh, all night long, trying to find out what is in this uh, budget. But we could, for instance, we might want to include uh, uh, the elimination of the 4.3% gasoline tax, which severely impacts my district and the people I represent, a lot of you, of you here too. Um, or we might want to... Uh, uh, and replace that incidentally with some other spending cut to make up for the lost revenues and uh, I for one uh, would like to do that with eliminating the space station which would save billions of dollars and replace that entire 4.3 billion dollar uh, 4.3 cent gas tax or uh, I've just discovered during the course of this debate that there is a 20 percent increase on diesel fuel that affects every farmer in my district as well as every boat owner and uh, uh, I'll say to my good friend from Sanibel, Florida, we're wiping out the luxury tax, but we're putting on something almost as onerous here. Uh, and I didn't even know that was in this bill. That, to me, I think is a scope problem. Uh, again, uh, there's the retroactivity of taxes uh, in the bill. And we pointed out during the debate here that uh, uh, even though there are uh, retroactivity on the tax cuts, it is on that area of income which doesn't generally create new jobs where the retroactivity on the tax increases uh, does severely impact new jobs uh, so those are things that we might like to consider not all of them in, in perhaps in one but uh, uh, we would like to have our traditional motion to recommit with instructions and bring it right back with that correction the house could vote up or down on it and uh, certainly would not uh, delay, I don't think it would delay our departure from, from Washington more than uh, 24 hours. Jerry, would you yield I'd to me for a moment? I'd be more than glad to yield my uh, fellow I'd, New Yorker. I, thank you. I, I'm sorry uh, to hear you say that Republicans were not invited uh, to the conference committee meetings. I served on two, and in both of them, they were heavily attended by Republican members. No, uh, not according to uh, any of the conferees that I spoke to. They were there. They Signed were. the report. Yeah. They were there? Yes. Well, uh, with the uh, first of Ways and Means on Health. Uh -huh. I think we had three meetings. They attended mm -hmm. all of them. Mm -hmm. And one on Armed Services with Sonny Montgomery and Jay Rockefeller. Mm -hmm. And they were there. I went voluntary. I, I went to the ed education um, um, subcommittee meeting just as an observer. Mm -hmm. And uh, they're both Republicans from the House and Senate attended uh, th all of those meetings, too. Mm -hmm. I understand. If, uh, I think I, I, I have the time, and uh, I understand that, that, that all of those uh, committees, and I specifically talked to the Defense uh, Appropriations Subcommittee, uh, that uh, none of them were invited into the negotiations until after the fact, until the package had been put together, and then they were showed their portion of that budget. But that's, uh, no, that again, I, is what I was told by each one, and I checked with each one of them down the line. I didn't go to the negotiations. I was only when the committee was doing its work, and that's when they were there and, and contributed. I support the, at the education uh, subcommittee meeting. Democrats, Republicans alike had fists going and yeah. trying to knock it out. And finally, I think they were the last uh, committee to get it worked out. I wasn't in agreement with it. Uh, but they finally got something worked out, but there was joint participation mm -hmm. there. Mine too, both of them. Matter of fact, uh, Senator Jeffers really took a, took a lead as well as uh, Senator Dan Coates. What about Ways and Means? I was on the Ways and Means. We had uh, Moynihan and, uh, yes, Senator Packwood was there, and there were about seven Republicans from the House. Where were you guys? Yeah, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Uh, what, what office did you go to? Sorry. That's what happens when your subcommittees don't meet. Mm. Mr. You finished? Sure. Mr. Derrick. Well, you know, I would just like to say that I am sure that it was not intentional, but uh, the, uh, the gentleman from New York stated that it was going to, the fuel tax would apply to farmers, and it clearly says, and I quote, oh. the new tax would not apply to gasoline and diesel fuel used on farms for farming. Mm -hmm. 
Yep. That doesn't include the trucking gas, uh, diesel fuel. But you said farming. Well, they're going to have to pay farm. for it is what I'm talking about. Well, they're gonna, but they're not going to have an additional tax. No, not to, not, not to run their tractor, but to br have goods delivered and for that truck delivering the milk. Off-highway mm -hmm. business use mm -hmm. of fuels. Off-highway. Yeah. That's, that's right. right. That's right. Well, that's fun. I'm talking about on highway. on the highway. Yeah, sure. well, they, uh, and you, you don't know anything about we, we farming. We need to get Mr. Smith back here. <laughs> how, how do you get your milk, my friend? How do you get the milk to market? For yeah. Farmer Smith, huh? Well, question comes on the motion. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. No. <laughs> Any other motions? I would please ask for recorded vote. The gentleman asks for recorded vote. The clerk will call the roll. No. No. Mr. Dillon, so. Mr. Cross. No. Mr. Barney. No. Mr. Hall. Mr. Lee. No. Mr. Gordon. No. Mr. Slaughter. No. Mr. Slaughter. No. Mr. Solomon. Aye. Mr. Quillen. Aye. Mr. Dreyer. Aye. Mr. Goss. Aye. Mr. Chairman. No. On this matter, four members haven't voted in the affirmative. Eight in the negative. The motion of the gentleman uh, from New York is not carried. Question now comes to the motion of the gentleman from South Carolina, Mr. Derrick. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. 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 The ayes appear to have it. The ayes have roll it. Roll call, Mr. Chairman. Clerk will call the roll. Wait a minute. You missing all the action? Okay. <laughs> we, we want this recorded. <laughs> okay. Well, when do you want us to start? I, I asked for a revote. <laughs> uh, uh, okay. Mr. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Derrick. Aye. Mr. Bielenson. Aye. Mr. Frost. Aye. Mr. Bonnier. Aye. Mr. Hall. Mr. Wheat. Aye. Mr. Gordon. Aye. Ms. Slaughter. Aye. Mr. Solomon. No. Mr. Quillen. No. Mr. Dreyer. No. Boss. No. Mr. Chairman. Yes. On this matter, eight members haven't voted in the affirmative. Four in the negative. The most the gentleman from <laughs> South Carolina, Mr. Dirk, has passed. The uh, gentleman from California, Mr. Bielenson, will handle the rule for the majority. And Mr. Solomon, assisted by Mr. Quillen, Mr. Dreyer, and Mr. Goss, will handle for the minority. Uh, going to have a little power here. The... Uh, all work seems to be completed this evening, so the Rules Committee will now adjourn. Mr. Chair, when will we meet again? Uh, we may meet again tomorrow. On what bill? Uh, it could be the second part of the defense bill, or we can meet Friday on it, I'm not sure. So we get anything on the RTC? What? Oh, no. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, the, the, we, there is a possibility, Mr. Dreyer, there is a possibility we may meet on the conference report on the National Service Bill. What about the RTC? Well, we've been taking the pulse on that, and it's uh, still alive. We're waiting. <laughs> yes, just barely. We're what waiting about, he to hear. What about the land management? Uh, BLM. I don't think. I think that's pulled for. Keep this out. Yeah. Committee stands okay. adjourned. Okay. See you tomorrow. Right on. Well, so you check over that big tight tonight. Yeah. Oh, okay. You don't get any corrections. <laughs> yeah. Time reading. <laughs> oh, I had to apply. Yeah. The full House will debate and vote on this rule sometime Thursday. A rule as crafted by the Rules Committee is a legislative mechanism that defines the parameters of the debate. If the rule passes, debate and a vote on the final passage of the president's budget plan will follow. The Senate will most likely take up the Clinton budget plan on Friday. Democratic leaders are hoping to complete work on the budget plan before adjourning for the August recess sometime this weekend. Now, if you would like to comment on this hearing by the Rules Committee, write to the panel. Here's the address for you. Room H312, the Capitol, in Washington, D.C. And the zip code is 20515. C-SPAN, the cable satellite public affairs network and its companion network C-SPAN 2.